First of all, this is Paul's fault. Yeah, Paul. You know, N1OG the Grouch? Yeah. Paul is at the drop zone I work at right now. And while we were waiting for weather and whatnot during the 4th of July weekend, he showed me his ham clock. And it was very nice and useful because I actually understood what it was doing after he showed me what was happening. I've played with ham clock before. I'll admit it never really made a ton of sense to me and it's because I just didn't, I didn't read the instructions. He showed me the basics of what we need to actually make it useful. So here I am, I'm gonna make a video about it. I know that there are other people out there that have made videos about it. As a matter of fact, Paul himself told me that KM4 ECK Jason made a great set of videos on it. I haven't gone to look at them. Yeah, I'm stubborn and knuckleheaded and all that stuff. Sorry, Jason. <laughs> Anyhow, I did this with a uh, Raspberry Pi and I posted it to my patrons and asked them if they were interested in uh, seeing a video on how this is done and they said yes. So here we are. First of all, we're gonna start with a Raspberry Pi. This is a Raspberry Pi 3. You can use a 3, a 4, a 5. I don't know if you can use a 2 or a 1. I don't imagine those are very handy these days and I don't know that they have enough horsepower to do what this needs to do. But for the sake of this video, I'm using a 3 for the in making this. We're gonna make a standard Raspberry Pi image. I'm gonna take you really quick and dirty through it. There are very detailed videos out there on how to do this already. I don't wanna belabor the point. So here we have Raspberry Pi Imager. I have already inserted my micro SD card into the reader, so I'm going to choose the device type. Uh, in this case, I'm going to go here to Raspberry Pi 3. I'm going to go with Pi 3 64 bit, and I'm going to tell it to use my micro SD card. I'm going to edit the settings of my Pi ahead of time. This is going to be called Ham Clock Pi. I know what the username is because I just said it before starting this video uh, and I know what the password is. I'm going to connect it to my IoT network, which is a separate network for things that I don't want on my real network. And then I'm going to tell it I'm in near Fort Wayne, Indiana and that US keyboard and so on and so forth. I'm going to enable SSH for this Pi specifically. I'm going to use password authentication. Normally I would use public key, but that's a headache for a different day. I'm not explaining that here. And when I'm done, I want it to alert me, eject the media, and enable telemetry on the Pi. Hit save, apply the customizations, tell it yes. It's going to ask me for my password. It's not on screen asking me for my password. I want to type that in, and we're off to the races. It's going to make the image. When it gets done, I'll come back. As you can see, the Raspberry Pi imager is done. Click on continue, and we're done with it. Now what do we do next? The next step is simple. We're going to take our micro SD card, our Raspberry Pi, join them in marriage. Next, we're gonna put a monitor and power to this, keyboard and mouse, network is already part of the Wi-Fi, and get hand clock installed. The next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna actually SSH into the Raspberry Pi. You can do this from the Raspberry Pi console itself. I just find SSH to be more convenient. And here we have our Pi is ready. Let's actually get the ham clock downloaded and ready. So we're going to go to the ham clock website and follow the instructions on getting the ham clock. So here we are on the ham clock website. We're going to go to desktop and we're going to follow these commands to get our installation of ham clock going. I'm going to copy the command set and then I'm going to go to my terminal where I have the connection over SSH and I'm going to paste my commands in there. So I right click and paste. We're gonna answer some questions here. Proceed, yes. So here we continue with the Q&A section of the video and that is, we're gonna answer some more questions. Build this for web access only and in this case, I'm gonna say yes. But understand that my intended purpose may be different than yours. In my case, I want to be able to access this ham clock from any web browser that's on my network. I want to just do the web interface. I'm going to use the Raspberry Pi itself to display it inside of a web browser with other stuff 
I'm going to go ahead and select the highest resolution possible because I like to tax my Raspberry Pi with a lot of work. Select the resolution that works best for you. Keep in mind that you can always run this script again and choose a different resolution or choose the full screen version of the ham clock. Okay, this is uh, not set in stone. The Q&A continues. Ham clock, start ham clock automatically each time the Pi is booted. I'm going to say yes, because I wanted to do that. And now we are good to go. All we have to do is type in ham clock and it will run in the background. Keep in mind that the process of running that script takes a few minutes. On this Pi 3, it took about 15 minutes total. The Raspberry Pi doesn't have a ton of computing power, so it takes a bit of time. The newer the Raspberry Pi, so the 4 is going to be faster than the 3, and then the 5 is going to be faster than the 2 or the 3. So just keep in mind that if you're using a Pi 3, this process will take longer, a Pi 4 will take less time, and a Pi 5 will take less time still. You get what I'm saying. So now we're going to type ham clock. And because I've opted to do this over the web interface, it means that I can pull this up on a web browser on the same network. Let me show you. So now we're going to type in the IP address of the ham clock. In this case, this is the one for my ham clock. And at the end, we're going to add a colon 8081 slash live.html. This will bring us up to the very initial configuration of the ham clock. Because this is a brand new install, I have to give it some information. So I'm going to give it my call. And then I'm going to sort of give it my grid coordinates. I'm going to tell it my grid square, which is close enough for what we're trying to do. This will be EN71GG. There are other pages of settings that you can change, but all you really need to fill in are the call and your grid square. You can go through these pages if you like. Once we're back to page one, I'm going to go ahead and click on done. And this will give you the startup process for your ham clock and no i don't care that you people see my mac address or my ip address or any of that stuff because it doesn't bother me i have a firewall for a reason so we get to basically where i would always get stuck in a ham clock what uses this right well here's where it, it, it became fun once paul showed me what i could do first of all Let's change the way this looks. If you click to the left of your call sign, it'll change the color of the, of the text for your call sign. If you click to the right of the call sign, it'll change the background color. So let me cycle through this, get back to orange text on black background, works for me. Next, the DE square is where am I at? De, from, me, right? This is gonna be inferred from the grid square that I gave. If I wanted to change this, what I have to do is I have to click on the DE line, on the actual DE, and you're going to see my options. I can change from showing me all the info, to showing me a simple analog, to showing me a calendar, an annotated analog, a digital 12-hour clock, a digital 24-hour clock. And then I'm going to click on OK to confirm it. That's how you change that DE paint. You can change the DX by grabbing the DX pin and moving it around. Right now, the DX pin is set to the west coast of Africa. You can grab it and move it some other place. I clicked over here near Australia. I'm gonna set it as DE. I'm sorry, I'm gonna set it as DX and then click on OK. And as you saw, that's also how you change your DE. You also have to be more patient than I am because again, this is running on a Raspberry Pi 3. It takes it a minute to do the calculations and you see how it's popping this DE or and the X site on a regular because I clicked it I clicked on it too much so now the ham clock is going to calculate the vocab for the DE me where I'm at to the DX where I pointed my DX to and here is your vocab for that for those two locations this is a vocab prediction okay this not doesn't mean it's going to work but based on this I have a chance of hitting Australia from where from my home at uh, 0400, we're actually starting at what? 0200 Zulu on 20 meters. I can try 15 earlier than that. I can try 17 earlier than that. But as you can see, we're red 
on on all of 15 so just marginal and yellow a little bit you know 17 meters so not you know marginal but still not an, a great setup we don't have a green box anywhere in there today let's switch the de to uh let's say columbia when i said de i meant to say dx so now that i've set dx to columbia i'm going to click on ok and you see that the vocab prediction has now changed for the path between my home and Columbia. And I have a lot more options on bands and times when I can try to make that connection. Handy, right? We have other panes that we can change in here. We can change the way this map displays by clicking up here on the upper left hand corner and selecting multiple maps. So right now we have the countries map. Let's say I want to do the muff vcap and the weather and the clouds and i'm going to leave everything else as is click on ok and again the raspberry pi is in the background churning away getting the data that i need in order to render this okay so give it a minute and as you can see now it has the clouds uh satellite picture from noah and it will cycle through the maps that I told it to on a regular basis based on the settings that I gave it earlier. Another neat feature that I happen to like, this is actually the one that really got me, was clicking on the DX. If you click on DX, this window will appear. It shows you the amateur radio satellites that are that you can track with ham clock. If it's green, it means that it's visible to your location right now. So let's for the sake of argument click on cast 4B and okay it's going to take a second to draw the map and you can see the footprint of this satellite is actually moving towards me it's getting better and it's drawn around and you see my location is that orange pin you see the satellite's getting closer to me i should be able to go outside and work the satellite right now if i wanted to the prime is going to be that center target that we have that's a direct overhead and look over here is giving you where to aim your antenna so that you can make so that you can have the best probability of making the contact. So right now, the path is is having me point my antenna almost directly west. And as if I were to leave this here, it'll progress and show me which way to aim my antenna. This not only gives you an indication of direction but also elevation. When it's here, I need to be aiming north, ever so slightly north but overhead that's what that center of the graphic means it means directly overhead if that line were off to the north i would have to aim it at the horizon into the north so this gives you a real good show of where you need to be aiming for you to be able to try to get the satellite neat right other things that we can use hand clock for you saw that transition of maps. I didn't trigger that. That's just the system. It, it was time for the switch and it switched. Let's click on the upper left hand corner of this pane and we have options here. And again, whatever we tick on these options is what it will rotate through for information for us. So let's say that we I want to see the contests that are going on right now and uh, the weather at my DE location. And let's say I want to see the expeditions happening and let's say i want to see live spots so right now i've selected a bunch of stuff select or unselect so let's it had the x-ray uh, factor set up i can uncheck that if i don't want to see it once i click on ok it's going to cycle through those panes that i selected so right now this weekend we're going to have several contests happening we have all those that you see listed there guess what we can do the same thing with the rest of these panes click on the upper left hand corner of the middle pane now I can say, show me who's on the air, show me the sunspot number, and you see that it just cycled. So we have live spots right now. There's one live spot on 40, two on 20, uh, 61 on 15 meters, 55 on 12. And as it is displaying those live spots, you see the lines tracing the connections. And keep in mind that these are live spots in EN71. I'm in grid square EN71. So it's showing me the live spots that matter to me. These are connections that are happening now. If I wanted to work those stations, I know that someone else has the ability to hear them in my grid square. 
and we can see who's on the air on the center pane that, that one cycled. We see that K7CAR is at US 6067. I believe that is pulling from the POTA website. And now we switched over to the sunspot number. Guess what? The vocab pane, we can also click upper left hand corner of the vocab pane and select what else we want to see. In this case, let's say I want to see the face of the moon. So now it's going to cycle between the face of the moon and the vocab predictions. The NCDXF, same deal here. You can click on there and add other things to the mix. I'm just going to leave that alone for now. And you can see that the satellite is still tracking, right? It's already gone overhead on us. We see the footprint happening and that right now, if I would try to work this bird, I would have to be aiming uh, to the east, northeast and aiming, getting shallower, it's getting closer to the horizon. Here we change the map again on its own. Neat stuff, right? Let's go back to the satellite pass and click on, the, on that square. We can change the satellite and we have other satellites that are going to be green for us. If it's red, it's either sat or about to set. So probably not something you want. And of course, everybody's favorite, the ISS. Click on that, click on OK. And you can see the parabola of the ISS. It's going to be a little bit difficult to see on this map, but here's the ISS. I can see it. Hopefully you can as well. And you can see that it's going to follow this parabola here and come out on this side of the globe and make another pass that's going to come close to my home again. Paul showing me that very much changed my use of hand clock because before it was just a neat little trinket to put on the wall and I wasn't doing much of that anyways but now I actually have a real world use for the hand clock and it lets me and it's going to probably help me get better contacts when I'm trying to work satellites if you want to make your hand clock available outside and you're going to port forward make sure you're port forwarding port 8082 not port 8081 port 8081 is the read and write port. Port 8082 is the read only port. That way people can't be messing with your ham clock while you're trying to use it. Some caveats to ham clock. It limits itself to a maximum of 80% of the CPU of whatever device you're running it on. So if you're monitoring resources on your Raspberry Pi or whatever device you run this on, and you're seeing that it's, only, that it's leaving something on the table, it's because by default it will do that. You can execute the program with a higher priority and a higher CPU load if you want to. I choose to leave it at 80%. A handy resource, ham clock. I'm certainly going to start using it as it was intended to now. I hope this was useful to you. Catch you in the next one. 7-3.